and I'll say to you, good Sunday morning and welcome to all of our people streaming, and we have lots of them these days. Um, we invite you to join us this morning as we continue our Lenten journey. I have just a couple announcements. I'm going to read from the list here. First of all, we welcome back some of our snowbirds already. Everybody, yay! There's a good one right there. All those birds that have been flown away have come back to roost. That's a good thing, by the way. Um, the Bible study is going amazingly well. We had 17 people again this week, but they were a different 17 people. There were some that, that couldn't come that were here the first week, so God is blessing us with this. So we've had 17 people each week, different people mixed in. If you, I want to uh, tell the streamers and um, you guys who are here just coming back, if you have not started to view the Chosen series, it's a free series. It is, uh, you can Google thechosen.com and it will take you to their free website. And it's not about selling anything, it is not that at all. It is purely to spread the new perspective and a new cultural perspective on the New Testament primarily. So um, you are welcome to do that. We are on season two, and uh, we will probably be continuing and back up and do season one. But whatever, whatever you can do to uh, see if you can get that uh, season, we will be able to then have some commonality to talk together. Um, this is the last week for Easter flower reservations, March 25th. Somebody, is that the end of the week? Friday, there we go. This Friday is the deadline. Um, you can pick up a flower envelope at the back of the church, drop it in the uh, treasure chest, or uh, uh, send it to the church, or give Joanne a call and say it's coming, so we get the right amount uh, of orders in right away. Uh, what else did I miss? Uh, we are, this spring, when we get the, all the gang back, we're going to uh, do another usher greeter invitation. We'd like to fill out our ushers so we can get on that rotating system that we try to get on. And uh, Sandy Hamill will be um, asking for some help. Sandy, do you want to tell them? Uh, okay. That's great. That's um, yep. <laughs> How's that working for you? No, moving on, moving on. Okay, thanks, Sandy. Yeah, um, that was Sandy's idea for people who used to be able to bake but they, don't, they can't bake and make little things anymore, um, you can still sign up there, and then Sandy will make that happen, um, and, and then that's the way you can help us contribute for coffee hour. And actually, it was Vita's idea. There we go. <laughs> because Vita doesn't want to bake all those things anymore, you know? All right, so we welcome you all this day. It is good to see the pews. Um, she's not here yet, is she? Darlene? Okay, good. Okay, she's not here yet, so I can talk, and we can leave the stream on. Um, reminding you that today is Ann Coates' 90th birthday, and it's a surprise. Next Friday. Good enough. Yeah. Anyway, and we put out a, a notice to bring a birthday card, so if you haven't done that or you've got it with you, um, you can take it into the parlor. Um, and she's not here yet, so <laughs> in her honor, we will begin the service. Margie, if you would me, please, if you're able.
Good morning. Join me in our call to worship. Lent calls us to journey, following Jesus wherever he leads us. Lent calls us to journey to the place where God comes with us to receive the new name we are given. Lent calls us to worship together to tell future generations the good news. Lent calls us to faithful living, to trust the one who gives us life. Let us worship God who walks with us today. And for the sharing of the peace, you'll find a yellow card in your pews. And we'll follow Margie. Be to the streamers, everybody way, yeah, dudes. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> My bad, I forgot we got guests and new people here. It's like, you're, we weren't waving at you, we're waving at the streamers. Hi, streamers. All right, come on. Marjorie just said there's announcement how great it is to hear people actually singing. Amen. Here she comes. Let's just clap for the birthday girl while we're at it. Timing is great. Timing is great. All right. Yay. I know you had that timed, Annie. I know you did. All right. Let's turn back around and continue with the service. Okay, our call to confession. We are a people born of water and the spirit. We have made promises to Christ's faithful disciples and to show his love to our life's end. Although we fail to fulfill those baptismal vows, God's faithful love endures forever. Confident of God's grace, let us confess our sins together. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose faith is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding you in our refuge and strength. Through Jesus Christ, your Son. And on this day, in our Lenten journey, I say to you, you live as forgiven people because you walk with the grace and the forgiveness of what Jesus Christ did for each of us. And so I say to you, live in the light, live forgiven by God's grace. Amen. And you may be seated. Our sermon hymn this day is number 250. It'll be on the screen. In the bulb there is a flower.
our prayer for illumination. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone. Let the heavenly food of scripture we are about to hear nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Our reading, uh, Old Testament reading today is from Isaiah in the 55th chapter. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk, without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and a commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. And our psalm is Psalm 63. I will read the first three, voice, three verses, and you will read verse five, 4 and 5. And you can find that on page 684. Oh God, you are my God, and I long for you. My whole being desires you. Like a dry, worn-out, and waterous land, my soul is thirsty for you. Let me see you in the sanctuary. Let me see how mighty and glorious you are. Your constant love is better than life itself, and so I will praise you. This is the word of the Lord. We continue this Sunday morning in our journey through the book of Luke this year. And uh, this morning, we're looking into chapter 13. I'll be reading a short verse of this. It's the parable of the barren fig tree. Um, and the reading starts with verse 1 and goes through verse 9. In the first set, it's like two separate readings with two separate thoughts. But I will uh, explain that in the first verse, um, Jesus is telling his disciples um, Everybody that you see, you better tell them they need to own up to their sins because if they're ignoring them, they're going to perish. And that's the main message. And I'm not sure whether it was because of uh, aghast stares or <laughs> um, because they didn't believe it or because they were confused. Apparently, Jesus thought it was necessary to put it in a story which is where we get the parables from. So this morning I read to you six through nine, the parable of the barren fig tree. Then Jesus told this story, a man planted a fig tree in his garden and he came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years, and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in my garden. 
the gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year, and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. Hear the words of Luke. Thanks be to God. Friends, when good things happen to an unsuspecting fig fruit tree, Jesus' short parable about a fig tree speaks of eminent judgment. You might remember that John the baptizer, using similar images in Luke that we've studied in chapter 3, said, even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees, Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Wow. Wait a minute. Hold on. Not yet. At least the tree provides some shade. Birds might nest in it. Cut it down? Not yet. Perhaps side benefits are these things I just mentioned, but it isn't the fig tree's main reason for being. There's a group in uh, California called the Valley Fig Growers, and they tell us that figs, first of all, have no blossoms on their branches like other fruit trees. Hmm. So perhaps if you go out and look at your fig tree and you don't see any blossoms, you may think it's dead. Cut it down. But there are inside the fruit tiny blossoms that then produce crunchy little edible seeds. I did not know this. And they give the fig a unique texture. Here's something else I find interesting. Figs are harvested when fully ripe, and they are partially dried on the tree. Hmm, again, let's say it's at the end of the fruit season, and you start to see these figs shrivel up. And if you don't know about fig growing, you might think, Oh, they're dead. All that to say, my friends, that we do not know everything in the world, particularly about figs. Interesting that Jesus had already taken that into consideration. Sir, the gardener says, leave it alone just for one more year. Give it one more chance, right? And what does he say then? I'll tend to it. I'll dig around it and take care of those weeds. And it even says in the scriptural text, I will fertilize it. I'll give it lots of fertilizer and tend to it. If it bears fruit next year, yippee, great. And if it doesn't, then you can cut it down. Hmm. A cultivated yet unproductive tree then may live even without bearing fruit, only because it's been granted additional time to do what it's supposed to do. Bura, there it is for us. Get it? Yeah, we're the fig trees. Okay, and maybe every year we don't quite manage to come up to snuff. But if people don't know your heart, they may not understand the idea that Christians believe that they can live as forgiven people. Remember the pardon that was just issued to you this morning? Remember that you are forgiven people. And because of that, you get to walk on and grow on 
and live and even experience doing your job in the future. Friends, that's hope. That's hope that God has not given up on you, even when you screw up. And God knows, particularly Jesus Christ knows, that we are not perfect people. Um, Will all the perfect people please raise your hand? Just saying. And there's one in the back at the audio station. You know, there's one in every crowd. (laughs) Okay. Make sure you don't cut off my sound feed back there, Ruddick. Yeah. Okay, so the tone of this story emphasizes what? Patience, right? All, All those people who have experienced impatient, please raise your hand. Now we're talking. All right. There we go, gang. It's about patience and what else? It's about mercy. It's about, it's okay. I know you didn't give us a whole bushel this year, but I forgive that and you get another chance next year. Some people may say this allegory is too simplistic, right? We, some people say that the allegory, of course, is that the owner of the fig tree and the garden plot is God. The gardener, any guesses? There it is, I'm hearing it. Yeah, the gardener in this allegory is Jesus. He's the one that pleads on your behalf. Wait a minute, they're not bad folks. It's not a bad tree. It's just that it needs someone, what? To help them remember who they are. That's hope, kids. Got it? That's hope. So Jesus is the gardener. Now it makes sense why Jesus would choose a simple fig tree to illustrate the point that try as we might to please God, right? We can't do it as Christian believers without Jesus Christ. That's pretty simple, right? And then what? Then enter humanity, right? Yeah. Repentance here just doesn't mean expressions of regret. Now we're going to go a little further. You with me? Okay. It just doesn't mean, God, I'm sorry. I I know I screwed up, and you mean that. It's deeper than that. It's not either a plea to do a turnaround and know that you will do better tomorrow. Rather, here and many other places in Scripture, it refers, this one's a tough one, stay with me, it refers to a change of mind, not just words, right? It's harder than it sounds, right? Okay, God, I am truly sorry. I really am. I feel it in my heart and my spirit, and I will try my best to do better next time, and silently, I'm going to fill in the blank for some of us at some time that says, but I don't think I really can do it. I know I'm going to screw up again. And then what? We're forgetting that Jesus Christ came to take care of that problem for all time. We ask the gardener to help us try again, live forgiven, do better. How? We can't dig our own hole around our roots. We can't add our own fertilizer around those roots so that we will do better, but Jesus can. That, friends, is faith. That is the Christian belief at its, no pun intended, root. You can't flourish. You can't be, what's that? Uh, Was it an army one? Be all that you can be. (laughs) You can't be all that God designed you to be without the help of Jesus. Wow. So... What's different? What's different in this passage is that that need for repentance is assumed. Jesus assumes 
when he tells the disciples this story, that they already know what I just said, that these gentlemen know that they are sinners and they need repentance. They need to own up to their wrongs. And so the need takes a back seat to the urgency in Jesus' call. Right? So he assumes that we all know that we need to repent. And his focus in this short little parable is, and it's urgent because the owner says, cut it down now. <laughs> cut it down now. I see no turn for the good. I see dead. And again, Jesus steps in through the gardener and says, hold on, not yet. Give it one more year. Thank you, Jesus, yes? This Lenten season in particular, we see examples of trials, evil showing itself, and for Ukrainians, I imagine, millions have had thoughts of how fleeting their existence might be. How suddenly, without warning, their lives are being cut down. And perhaps for those fleeing survivors, they bring into focus just how fragile their lives are on their own. And in fact, they may even start to turn to that feeling of hopelessness, thinking that there is an unforgiving dictator that will show no mercy on them. My friends, our prayer should be for those fleeing souls this day that a lot of them believe and know that there is a Jesus Christ, that there is a God of all people that forgives and yes for them, even protects when it seems like they are going to be cut down. Violence that comes from human beings inflicting upon unsuspecting people, natural disasters of floods and tornadoes and all of those things that God simply seems to allow, he does not blame the victims. He does not attempt to defend creation or the creator when questions of why seem warranted. At least in this scene, he does not attempt to defend, uh, defend creation and say why, but he offers no theological speculation in this passage. He asks with an urgency fueled by raw memories of blood and rubble at the time of this writing. And he says, what about us? How will you live the life you get to live? For people of faith, catastrophes like these in re recent days raise all sorts of questions that deserve discussion. And sometimes they drive us to mourn and lament a sermon that remains true to the movement of this biblical text, however, will focus primarily on the fact that here's what tragedies do. Tragedies of any kind in our lives arrest our attention, don't they? We've all been there in some fashion or another. Something that you can't explain and you ask the question, why God? arrests your attention, and it's what you focus on, is it not? And yes, I am praying and hoping that you include God in that, and it's okay, he says, right there, to ask him, why, God? Do we build our lives upon these rationalizations that allow us to get through the day feeling blessed and safe in a sense of denial? and able to presume upon a better fortune 
than that of our Ukrainian brothers and sisters? Well, God, at least I'm not as bad off as them. And that's a good thing to say. But you have those things, too. It's not about a scale of more or less. It's plain gang about the fact that we are walking in the human condition in this world one step at a time, and some days we feel two feet firmly on the ground, and we say, thank you, Jesus. And other days, we stand with our weight shifted onto one side of our body so we can remain upright because we have to fight on. And it's at this point that I pray you say, there is nothing I can do to maintain this stance except rely on the fact that I believe there is a God and I believe his son did extraordinary things for me so that I can again live what life I have left on this earth standing on two feet for him. And when you get there, it feels pretty good. It feels really good. So even though when we all know our own suddenly our world changed, we may face being cut down before we think it's our time. Perhaps we should look to Jesus, our gardener, to help us dig up our hardened ground and let it sink in to the soil and soak in to our roots. There it is. Let it soak into your roots that you live by grace and faith alone. May the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ and God the Father, through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, slip in to our roots at the core of our hearts so we will be ready and believe that we will have the opportunity, if God wills, to bear our fruit when the time is right. Amen. This morning, we are blessed to have Sandy Hollenbeck do our offertory meditation this morning. And I would remind us that uh, we are still in our almost finished winter season. We appreciate your continued gifts. Keeps this church running every day. The treasure chest is at the back of the church. If you are uh, visiting or you are just coming back, it's a good reminder that we live with God alone, but that is also the people of God alone together keep us hearing his scripture. Sandy? to me. Light. Do not fear.
take my yoke and leave your troubles. Take my yoke and come with me. Take my yoke, I am beside you. Take and learn humility. Rest in me, O weary traveler. Rest in me, and do not fear. Rest in me, my heart is gentle. Rest and cast away. Thank you for that reminder, Sandy. Let's go to our God in prayer, if you would join me. Holy and all-knowing God, when you created the world, you had intention that all people would know you. And for that, God, we are asking for one more year. Lord God, we see, once again, war and destruction. God, only you also knew that at this time it would be all over the world for people to view and watch as it happens. Lord God, we wonder, was that at your hand and your intention, or was that the hands of human beings racing to spread information and technology for everyone. Lord God, Jesus was a simple man. He was a simple human like ourselves. And yet, throughout 2,000 plus years, his story has been passed down without the aid of technology, God. And we sit here this morning and we are remembering the story of his journey to the cross for us. We also need to remember this day, God, that you ordained that he should rise again, and which is why we are walking that path to Calvary, so that we too, like victims of war, can remember for our own lives whatever our internal war is, that you will walk with us even when we think you don't. Lord God, we focus on the people in Ukraine this morning, thousands and millions of people, Lord, who are displaced suddenly and are asking for one more year. Lord God, you, through your spirit and divine wisdom, know that this is not the end of the story as we know it today. So God, we are asking for the strength, for the grace, for the mercy to stand on two feet and put one foot in front of the other. Lord Jesus, that's all we ask. As you did when you walked to the cross, so must we put one foot in front of the other because we cannot run at this time. And Lord God, you say through your son, that is enough, my child. That is enough. And so we do feel peace this day, and we do feel grace, and we do feel mercy. And you know what, God? We feel love. We feel love in this church community. We know that you are there with us. And so, God, to you be all the honor and the praise and the glory. Amen. Now, Lord, we return to you the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father. Give 
forgives our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us out of temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the world. Amen. And if you're able, this morning I invite you to rise for our sending hymn. It's O God of Every Nation. We will sing 1, 2, and verse 4, and uh, then we'll give the benediction response. Now may the grace and the power of God the Father together with Jesus Christ who died for you and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to direct your life all your days, I say go in peace. Amen. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Anne. Happy birthday. Listen to that. Thank you. Yay. Whoa. 
90 this Friday, 90, 90. We can do this. Come join for a celebration. We have food and cake and all of that stuff. <laughs>